Okay, so what we're learning today is about electrolytic cells. Electrolytic cells are the opposite of voltaic cells in the sense of spontaneity. Electrolytic cells require energy to force a redox reaction that is not spontaneous. For those doing net potentials, you would have an overall negative voltage or a zero voltage. So we're going against nature in the sense that we have to add energy to this system to force this process to work. So electrolytic cells, and inside that word you see electricity, these are non-spontaneous. And being non-spontaneous, okay, means that they require energy. All right. Now, requiring energy, okay, to force a redox reaction that's spontaneous usually means that we're going to use a voltaic cell to drive this process. So we're going to draw a voltaic cell or a battery. And I'm going to draw a battery up here. Okay, and I'm going to draw two terminals here or electrodes. This is my battery, my voltaic cell. Okay, now uh, a couple of other definitions or words that pop up with electrolytic cells is electroplating. and electrolysis. Okay, these two types, okay, of uh, setups require energy to force a non a spontaneous redox reaction to occur. I'm going to show you both, okay, and they have their basics from a voltaic cell. So if you learn how a voltaic cell worked, Okay, there's going to be some differences. Obviously, the first one is you. It, this requires energy. So electrolytic cells are more like an endothermic process, whereas the voltaic or galvanic cells were an exothermic process. Okay, they gave off energy spontaneously. These require. So there's going to be a, some small subtle differences. Okay, and I'm going to show you them now. Well, let's see. That's not going to work. Okay, so in any case. Let's start by trying to electroplate. So we're going to do electroplating first. Okay. However, these processes are very, very similar. Okay. Now, let's take a uh, an object. Okay. Let's say I take my very famous chicken fork, with the fork on a chicken leg. So this is a important piece of um, culinary piece of utensil you would use to eat. So let's pretend that's a some kind of metal, and I don't care what metal this is, we can pretend it's iron, but it does not matter, okay? Uh, and that's my fork, okay? And let's say I want to take my very famous chicken fork here, and I want to, um, I want to plate it and make it pretty. So I want to plate it, let's say, with gold. All right, well, I want the gold from this metal to plate on here. Now what that means is I want this gold, okay, to oxidize, okay, into Au plus three. Now three electrons are going to result in this Au three. I want to guess what? Reduce onto the fork. So let's talk about what's happening. If I want a plate on this fork, okay, I want the Au plus three. okay, to reduce into my solid metal. My metal that's zero is solid. Now, in order to do that, if you notice your half reaction, plus three to zero, I'm going to require, okay, some electrons. So I'm going to need, okay, three electrons to make that happen. And my half reactions, one of my checks is to make sure that each side of a half reaction has the same charge. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. This is 0. So this is my reduction. And that's what I want to happen. Okay, well, my oxidation, because in a redox reaction I have to have both, in order to um, have, okay, some plating going on, making solid uh, gold, I need my gold, AU0 solid, 
okay, I need to oxidize into Au plus 3, plus 3 electrons. It's got to give off 3 electrons. It's got to be forced to do so because, as you remember from your activity tables, gold resists oxidation so much so that you need to add energy to force it to happen. Now, in truth, Au plus 3 is pretty good at reducing. Okay, because if it's, remember, not spontaneous in oxidation, then it's going to be spontaneous in reduction. Okay, remember, voltages are pathways, are directionalities in reactions. That's what the Gibbs for energy that we learned about in my honors in AP. In any case, if you're not there in those courses, it's very simple. Okay, we're forcing gold to oxidize. Now, I want to force gold to oxidize. So I'm going to need to pull electrons away from the gold. All right. So to do so, I connect my gold electrode in this electrolytic cell, not a voltaic cell, to the battery. Now, I want to pull electrons this way. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to pull off these electrons to make my gold become Au plus 3 so that it could plate over here. Now, to pull electrons, we learned in the voltaic cell, electrons flow from what electrode to what electrode? Yeah, they always flow from the anode to the cathode. I'll just put cat up here. So this is the voltaic cell. This is the cathode right here. And what charge do we write the cathode for the battery, if you remember? Remember, we made it positive. And it was convention, something that we don't really measure. We just say, hey... Electrons, the final resting place in this circuit is the cathode because if you remember, you have copper plus two in here, or you, depending on what kind of cell you have, is an oxidizing agent. So this oxidizing agent working at the cathode electrode here of the voltaic cell pull, is pulling electro, electrons away from the gold. So the energy of the battery is forcing, okay, gold to give up its electrons. That force is that voltage we talked about, okay? Now that's one half of it. What else is happening? Well, if for gold plus 3, to actually plate, it needs to absorb 3 electrons or some charge. So we're going to have to force out some charge from the battery, and we connect it. Now, as you've t learned already, anox red cat. So red cat means at the cathode we have reduction. So this... okay. Uh, iron fork, no matter what metal it is, as long as it's a metal that conducts uh, electrons, this has to be my cathode. And if you notice, the oxidation half reaction, okay, parallels the idea that we, this needed to be the anode for two reasons. Okay, electrons flow from the anode to the cathode. That's the only way I can force gold to oxidize, right, to give up its three electrons, but oxidation is also occurring at the anode. So, both of those ideas, okay, are supporting the fact that this electrode must be the anode. Okay, well, back to here. In order for the gold plus three to become gold zero, which is solid, keep in mind, anytime you've got a metal that's zero, we're making a solid. So we're going to take the aqueous ion or the liquid ion, okay, if it's a molten state, and it's going to gain three electrons. So we need to have electrons available. So we need this basically voltaic cell to pump electrons to this, okay, metal fork. And we know electrons always flow from the what? The anode to the cathode. So this is the anode of the battery, which you probably already guessed because this is the cathode of the battery. Notice this is negatively charged in the battery. All right, and that's how the process works. So over time, we force electrons from the gold, a piece of it sends its electrons this way, and it becomes that Au plus 3. It's attracted to electrons that are pumped from the battery, and it plates. Okay, it gets bigger. This one gets smaller. We've always saw in the voltaic cell the cathode getting smaller. I'm sorry, the cathode getting bigger and plating, and the anode getting smaller. Now, you cut these leads, this stops. Okay. Now, one more piece to this puzzle is what are the charges? 
Okay, what are the actual charges at the cathode and anode? Well, believe it or not, we make this cathode a negative sign. At the electrolytic cell, okay, the cathode is negative. Now, the reason why we put a negative is because, well, this electrode that's negative is attached to this negative. And there you go. All right. In this positive cathode is attached to this gold. So the battery drives the charges. This side of the battery is positive, it makes this positive. This side of the battery is negative, it drives. So if these this battery was not connected, these charges would be neutral. And of course, nothing would happen. I mean, think about this for a second. Why does a gold plus three move toward the fork? because it's negatively charged. Now, again, it's a convention thing, but if we're moving electrons or charge on here, it kind of makes sense. And of course, we make this positive because electrons are flowing in that direction, if you'd like that. So electrolytic cells have some very simple things that are very similar to voltaic cells. In fact, they're the same. Electrons always flow from the anode to the cathode. Okay, Reduction still occurs at the cathode, so red cat and even anox still work, okay? And the uh, only thing that's different is that the charges on the anode and the cathode are switched because they're driven by the same side of the electrode that's charged, all right? And of course, there's no need for a salt bridge because we're not looking for electrical neutrality. We're trying to give this electrolytic cell okay, charges so that there can be a for, an energy flow or a flow of ions in a certain direction, okay? In any case, that's the major components of an electrolytic cell. It's an endothermic process that requires energy to force something to happen that normally wouldn't happen, all right? And those are the basic components. Now, this is electroplating. Electrolysis is essentially the same concept, except that we're not looking necessarily to plate an object. We're looking to separate, okay, a um, salt into its individual components. Let me explain. So I'm going to get rid of all this right here, and I'm going to set up an electrolytic cell. So it's the same kind of system, but in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate a salt into its individual components. For instance, let's take aluminum oxide. Let's draw another container here. And this time I'm going to use, oh, I just got rid of that. Oh, do that again. This time I'm going to use platinum electrodes. You may say, why am I going to use platinum electrodes? Because I'm going to use electrodes, okay, that have no ability or almost no ability to oxidize. So these are just places where oxidation and reduction can occur, but they themselves are not part of it. So these are platinum electrodes, okay? And we have different ones that we use, all right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to take a solution of, let's say, aluminum oxide. Let's continue. I gotta close this up here. Stuff spill over. So I have aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide. Now this is solid. So I'm gonna heat it till it becomes aluminum plus three and O negative two. And this is now gonna be in a liquid form. So we're gonna make molten. And sometimes you'll see the word molten to say that we just melted this ionic compound. And you should know that ionic compounds, okay? become ions or free ions when heated into a liquid state. So in any case, I have aluminum plus 3 and I have O negative 2 ions. Well, same system. I got a cathode be negative because it's connected to the negative part of the battery, the anode. So electrons are building up, okay, at the cathode. And this is positive because this is pulling charge back to the battery. Well, you guess what happens? The aluminum plus three absorbs three electrons. 
gets, guess what, reduced at the cathode to make pure aluminum. Look at that. All right, so we kind of plate on the cathode here. And the, aluminum, uh, the O negative 2 is attracted to the positive electrode. Kind of interesting how that all works out. And it, uh, it's forced to oxidize at the anode, anox, to become oxygen atoms. And it gives off two electrons. Better way to write this is two of these O negative 2s produced O2 gas, and four electrons are pulled back into the cathode of the battery. So you'll see some bubbleage occurring here. And that bubbles represent oxygen gas. So we're making the pure form of the elements. We're going in the reverse of nature. Nature took pure aluminum, okay, and pure oxygen, and it made the oxide. We're going in the reverse. So of course we have to add energy. But important process, as I'm showing you, um, aluminum oxide is very prevalent in the earth. Very prevalent, okay? Okay, in most countries, almost all countries have this. But it wasn't until we, dis we figured out this process called electrolysis, okay? And this is called electrolysis, not electroplating, because we're making the pure form of the salt. So sometimes they call electrolysis of a fused salt, and we're making the pure compounds here, all right? And the same idea occurs, okay? Anode to the cathode, okay? And um, the flow of electrons, anode to the cathode, and of course the charges are different. But getting back to aluminum oxide, aluminum oxide, uh, aluminum was one of the most expensive elements on the earth because we didn't know how to purify it. Now we can take the rusts, if you think about it, the oxides of metals, and now we can purify them. And that's how we purify many metals. Many metals are purified some electrolysis or redox types of reactions, smelting of ore, of iron, although it's not quite like electrolysis is very similar. But we do this with our group or group one uh, metals. I threw sodium in water for you this year, or pure potassium. How do we get the pure forms of, let's say, group one metals, or even group two metals, because we had a lab with calcium? How do I get the pure forms if they're so reactive, right? Because all we have in nature is calcium plus two or, or Na plus ions. How do I get pure sodium? Well, we take the salt, we heat them and melt them, and through electrolysis, we, f we make the pure forms of them. Okay, so electrolysis of a fused salt is how we purify metals or compounds into our original states at the cathode and at the anode. I hope this helped.